Well, I'm truly excited to be here with you once again and worship and exalt Jesus. Uh, we kicked off uh, the letter to the Philippians last week and we're gonna continue on in that. But before we do that, we're gonna spend a few moments uh, just singing and, uh, and exalting Jesus through song. So I would pray that you would just um, in anticipate encountering God today. And not just encountering Him, but truly worshiping Him and exalting Him. So if you would, why don't you stand with me and let's sing this song and then we will get into our teaching.
So how do you typically greet somebody? What's in a greeting, anyhow? You know what I'm saying? A greeting. Is it hello? I mean, I guess that depends upon the formality of the relationship, right? If it's a if it's a, a, an acquaintance that you know really well, um, you probably greet them a little bit differently. If it's someone, uh, it could be more formal, someone that you, you may have just first met or whatever. But you know, typically it's you know I shouldn't say typically, but you know we could say good morning, and we even shoot you know or good afternoon or good evening or whatever, and then we even break that greeting down to like morning or good evening, right? It's, it's just kind of odd, right? But today, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about like what a greeting, Paul greeting um, the people, the Christians in the, in the city of Philippi as he writes this letter to them. Last week, if you remember, uh, if you were here in person or if you um, watched it online, uh, we, start, we started in looking at the book of Philippians or the letter um, to the Philippians. And um, we talked about Paul's secret and how he could be content in, in any circumstance, which again was quite interesting and intriguing because when he was writing that, he was sitting in a prison, uh, a Roman prison, waiting for his execution. Not uh, on trial or anything, but literally waiting for his execution. His friends had deserted him, if you remember. Um, his friends had pretty much deserted him. They were jealous of him. Um, and th- no one really came to visit him except for a couple people. And, and, and even in that point, they, they didn't even know where he was at. And so they were at, you know, the person would ask around to find out where's Paul. They knew he was in prison, but no one knew where he was at. And it wasn't like the Romans were trying to keep it secret. It was, it was to, the effect, to the effect of he had been kind of deserted by all of his friends and, so, and colleagues. And so my point is, I mean, he, everything was kind of stripped away from him. Uh, you know, he was just sitting there all alone, but yet he was full of joy and he was able to pen out verses like rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, right? And, and you read about, and then he talks about, you know, discovering this secret. And, and so as we got into that, we realized that his secret was that he could be content in any circumstance. And as we read through this letter, we certainly see that. We see a letter full of joy when, when it should be full of, I would say, dismay, discouragement, despair. Uh, fear, maybe, of, of, of what's coming next, but that's not what we see. And the reason why we don't see that is because Paul allowed his mind to be filled and consumed with Christ. His mind was absolutely, that's all he thought about was Christ, and, and to, and to, um, to uh, you know, join in on the, on the sufferings of Christ even. I mean, he considered all of that a joy because it enabled him to get to know Christ even more so. What, just, just, it's very intriguing to me uh, because it really goes against the human grain, doesn't it? It goes against the human grain. Now, as I shared with you last week, uh, the statement by Timothy Keller, who said, um, it's not that we think less of ourselves, meaning let's put ourselves down and be a doormat. That's not the point. But the point is that we think of ourselves less. We don't think of ourselves, we don't think less of ourselves you know, walking around like Eeyore, but instead we're thinking of ourselves less. And in, that's what Paul was doing. He wasn't, he wasn't spending his time thinking about himself. He was spending his time thinking about Christ. And so he was able to write this letter. So as we get into this, um, I, I, you know, um, I, I want to stop on the, and we could spend forever in this, in this letter. It's just so rich and so deep. Um, but I would like to stop on the second verse as we jump into this, chapter 1, verse 2. And it's, he's greeting the Philippians. He's writing to the church in Philippi. He's writing to Christians. And he says this in verse 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we look at this and we look at that word grace. And that word grace was a very common greeting, okay? Okay. The world at that time, I don't know about the whole world, but there, this particular area, they used that word and it meant literally, it was just a greeting, like hello, you know, or good evening, good afternoon. It was, it was a very common greeting. In a cursory reading of the text, Paul uses, we look at this and we, we see that, okay, Paul's using this word grace like everyone else is using it as a greeting. 
But as he's writing to the church, we see that it is different. Again, as I said, grace literally means greetings. Okay? So there would be grace, grace to you, greetings, right? In the Gentile world, meaning the non-Jewish world, um, it meant greetings. The Roman Empire uh, used this in their official letters. Um, archaeologists have discovered many, 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 many hundreds, thousands of writings on papyrus that where the Roman Empire uh, used this as their greeting. Grace, grace to you know, and it was used by the officials in all of their letters. Another word that we see used in this greeting that Paul uses is peace. So he says, grace to you and peace. So again, just a cursory reading of this, we, it's like it's just like any other normal letter, okay? Um, and peace is another, um, another word that was used in greetings, grace and peace. It was just that, that was kind of the, the, the greeting, the opening of a letter or the greeting of one another. But the Jewish people used the word peace differently. The word peace for them was shalom, okay? Now, this would have been a very a, a common word even in Jesus' day, shalom, all right? However, as we take a deeper look into this, Paul uses the words grace and peace in a completely different context, okay? He uses these words, these two words, grace and peace, in a completely different context, which they had much deeper meanings. And so he was taking these two common words, grace and peace, and he was uh, um, using them, transform them, um, or they were transformed more into the Christian context. Now, the normal Greek word uh, was uh, for greeting, greetings was the word, uh, was the verb, Sharon or Sharon, C H E R E I N. But when Paul used it, he used it in the noun sense. So he didn't use it in the verb sense. He used it in the noun sense, which would have been charis, C H A R I S. And using it in this form, as he always did, he associated it with the grace of God. Not just grace, but the grace of God. Therefore, um, others, you know, used it simply as a greeting, but Paul is literally writing to the Christians, and this is what he's saying, God's grace be with you. That's his greetings. He takes, a, he takes this, this greeting and he takes it so, a, in a much deeper context, uh, in, the, in the context of, Christian, uh, of Christianity, okay? And he takes it, and the way he pens it out is, God's grace be with you, okay? Now, peace, again, is another common word used in, in, a, in a salutation. However, though, and this is where, you know, when Paul uses this, it's directly connected, and he's referring to the fruits or the implications of justification, which is the result of the reconciliation of, the, of a Christian with God, of a person with God, Okay? The reconciliation with God. So when Paul's saying grace and peace to you, he is taking it into the context of saying grace and peace to you, and he's referring to you, you, you now have great the grace of God with you according to the justification uh, and the reconciliation of Jesus Christ. Now what that means is that when God looks at us, when we respond to His free gift of grace and salvation, when He extends that to us, and we respond to that and we receive that, the result of that is He sees us through the blood of His Son. He sees us through the righteousness of His Son. Because remember, that's that great exchange that we've talked about. Meaning that when Jesus died on the cross, He took His righteousness, which was pure, and gave it to us and took from us our unrighteousness and filthiness. Okay, that's kind of like what we talked about last week when we talked about humility and obedience. Remember, we said humility has uh, there's two, kind of two components to it. One of those components is that you give something and you get something lesser in return, and that's exactly what what Christ did for us in humility and humbleness. He gave us His pureness, His righteous, His pure righteousness, sinlessness. So now, when God sees us, we are justified. We are now made righteous by the blood of Christ, and we are reconciled through that blood, through that, 
salvation, we are now reconciled with God Himself. There's no, no longer this chasm if we have responded to His free gift of grace and, and mercy and salvation. That's what we... And Paul is saying, greetings and peace to you, meaning that referring to that whole process there, okay? So let's talk about grace a little bit more. That's where I want to spend our time today is talking about grace. So when Paul addresses the Christians of Philippi, he's addressing them in the fullest Christian meaning, God's grace, okay? The unmerited favor on, of God on humanity. Now here's the deal. When we start talking about grace, it's, it's, kinda, it's one, another one of those concepts where we're, I think our finite mind is trying to understand the infinite. And it can be a bit difficult because just think about it in this. I think it's easy for, for us to struggle with the weight and the complexity and the meaning of grace. Because as humans, don't we run the temptation to believe that God loves us conditionally? I mean, don't you have that? Isn't there that temptation at times? Isn't that there a question at times deep, deep, deep down inside of you where, you where it is so hard to understand or wrap your brain around unconditional love that says God loves me unconditionally, regardless of my actions, regardless of what I do, God loves me. Now, again, where we're going to struggle with that is that someone might say, yes, but I get where you're going. And that is the temptation and that is the struggle. I'm not saying we can live however we want to live. That is, that's not what the Bible teaches. So we're going to put that to the side. I'm simply saying that as a human, in all of our relationships here on this earth, they're all conditional to some, to, to pretty much. They're all conditional, right? If you do this, then I'll give you this. If you break my trust, then I will extract my trust from you. And, I, and love can be withheld at times, right? We've all probably experienced that in relationships. We've all experienced that in unhealthy relationships. It's hard to love someone that's treating you negatively, that's treating you unfairly, that's treating you wrong, right, correct? So it's so easy for us to project that onto God, meaning that He loves me based upon my living. You know what? I had a great week. I, I was able to resist my big temptation. I didn't crack. I didn't fall into it. And man, do I feel close to God. Tomorrow, I sin, I fall into that temptation. I don't stay there. I struggle with it. I bounce back. I ask, for, I ask for forgiveness. But deep down, I don't feel close to God now because I screwed up. Right? I sinned. And again, I, I get this. But my point is, He loves, you know, it, it's easy for us to, to attach grace to He loves me for my piety. He loves me for my good deeds. He loves me uh, for my repentance and etc. On and on and on we go. And so it's hard for us to wrap our brains around to, to, to understand that that's simply not true, that God loves me. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. He says this, but God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for all people that were absolutely hideous in the sight of God's eyes due to their sin, due to our sin. And so in order to scratch the grace of God, we have to start with the fact that God moved, moves towards us graciously in Christ. Okay? Absolutely separate from our efforts. Now, I want to go back to it. <laughs> Here's my temptation. I want to go back to it. Because it's not like it's a license to sin. That's not what we're talking about here whatsoever. But we're talking about something much deeper. We're talking about something that, 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 that shows the activity of God, the love of God. That while we were still sinners, God moved to us. God provided a plan of salvation because He knew that we could not. So there's that, there's that component of unmerited grace where, where it's, it's not based upon our efforts. Now, hopefully, we respond to that and we, we um, you know, try and work our hardest to, to live a life that's pleasing to God, right? That we, that, we, that we repent of those things, that we, you know, we may struggle with those things, but we, we, we try to live a life that's that's, that's, that that um, shows that we love God in return, right? But at clear at the beginning of this, at the, the point I'm trying to make is this. God loves us not based upon our efforts or our piety or 
whatever it is, God loves us first. God moves to, towards us first, and then we respond to Him. There was this boy that was raised in a Christian home. This is hundreds of years, or many, many years ago. There was a boy that was raised in a Christian home. When he was six years old, his parents passed away. They both died. After they passed away and died, he is shuffled into another home that is not a Christian home. In fact, they actually mocked Christianity. They actually mocked his, uh, you know, his faith, and they actually persecuted it. After some time, he became very distraught over it, and he ran away from home, and he eventually became a sailor uh, in the British Navy. But even after a, you know, uh, so many years of that, he left that, deserted that, and he moved to Africa to just, as he said, to sin his fill, to just live out in sin, to just live however he wanted to do. That was his, that was his goal and his mission, moving to Africa. There in Africa, he connected with a Portuguese slave trader and even lived with them, his, him and his family. But the caveat to this was his wife was, or he became very cruelly treated by this family even, to the point that when the man was away, when the, slave, the Portuguese slave trader was away, his wife hated white men so much that she just made his life miserable. And she would even make him eat his food off the floor like a dog. That's how cruel and miser miserable uh, she made him. She definitely took her hatred out on him. So once again, he finds himself in a, in a very negative situation. He runs away. He flees from that. He, he, again, he's in Africa. He runs to the coast. He lights a signal fire. A ship sees it and actually picks him up. And this captain of this ship thought that this guy was probably an uh, ivory trader and was very disappointed to find out that he wasn't. However, he realized that this, um, I don't know how old this, this, this individual, this boy is at this time. I'm sure he's a young man at this point. Well, he is a young man at this point. Um, but he realized, so then the captain realized that this young man had some navigation experience and he made him a shipmate. However, this young man at some point gets into the ship's rum, drinks it with the crew members, gets drunk, falls overboard, and nearly drowns. Sometime on the voyage, uh, they're, and they're heading back to England. They're, going, they're heading back, uh, they're, again, they're going to England. But they encounter some extremely heavy winds, and their ship becomes absolutely battered by these winds and becomes uh, blown off course to the point where everybody on the ship thinks they're going to sink. The captain summons the kid, makes it, or the boy, or the man, I should say, the young man, makes him go down into the hold and man the pumps. While he's down there, during this storm, he becomes absolutely petrified. He's convinced that the ship is going to sink and he is going to drown down in the hold of this ship. He worked the pumps for days, and as he worked these pumps, in his fear and all this other you know, fear of dying and just being so distraught, he begins to cry out to God. In fact, he begins to recall from when he was such a young child, you know, six and you know, younger, he begins to recall some of the Bible verses that he was taught about God. And he begins to dwell on those and he begins to recite those Bible verses and he cries out to God. And consequently, what happens, he becomes transformed. He becomes born again. He eventually became a great teacher and preacher of the Word because he was so transformed and born again. This story is the story of John Newton. And I don't know if you're familiar with John Newton, or if you've been in the church for a while, or if you've been around for a while, but John Newton was the one who penned out those lyrics that says, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Newton discovered what Paul is speaking about right here, the grace of God. The grace of God and God alone. The unmerited, undeserving 
grace, never based on our performance, never based on our piety, based solely upon God alone. Completely resting in the love of God. That's what Paul was talking about here, and that's what John Newton found. Paul is addressing the Christians saying, grace be to you. The grace of God. So it's unmerited. It's also unbounding. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, he says, the law came along to multiply the trespass. But where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. There's another story of a young kid. This is, this is kind of a, well, it's, it's a handful of years ago. But there was this, this kid that may help us kind of see the, the, kind of illustrate this point a little bit. There was this kid or this guy who was waiting tables in Florida, and he was making about $4 an hour, okay? However, he suddenly inherited $3 million from his father's estate. Now, I would say that's grace abounding, right? Going from $4, scratching out, eking out, you know, uh, you know, eking out a life, and going from $4 an hour in tips to all of a sudden, just, just out of the blue, inheriting $3 million. Now again, that isn't compared to this. I'm not saying that's the abounding grace of God. I'm simply saying it's kind of like that in a sense, right? You, it, but however, you know, the grace of God doesn't start with $4 an hour by any means. But I'm just saying God's grace is exponentially greater than what we deserve or ever experience. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4, 14 and 15. He says, We know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and present us with you. Indeed, everything is for your benefit, so that grace extended through more and more people may cause thanksgiving to increase to God's glory. You know, it's grace is what created all things for us to enjoy. Grace is what created the mountains and the seas and everything that, that populates them and in them, right? Grace is what created humans in God's image and the capacity to enjoy a relationship with Him. Grace is what chose Israel for a special purpose. Grace is what sent Jesus to this earth and lived the perfect life to, to, to reveal to us, in addition to reveal to us the Father and, and consequently to die on the cross for our sins. Grace is what enables us to trust in Him. Grace is what sent the Holy Spirit to you and I to live inside of us, to teach us, to lead us, to encourage us, and to correct us at times. Grace is what has preserved the church for years and years. Grace is what will bring final resurrection, and it's grace that will enable us to live in fellowship for eternity with God Himself. Paul is writing about that grace. Grace be to you. He's also writing about peace. Now here's the deal. Peace is shalom, right? It's, it's also a common word. It's the peace, though, that comes from God that we're talking about. It's not the absence of conflict or the absence of hardships, but it's the peace that comes from God. Grace is the unmerited and abounding favor of God, and peace is the result of that favor, the result of the work of the cross, the reconciliation between God and man. Remember the separation, that chasm that we could never cross on our own. Grace is what bridged that chasm and created reconciliation between God and broken, fallen humanity. In the New Testament, we read about the promise of this peace uh, to the men. You remember when the angels came to uh, declare the birth of Christ? Peace unto you. Peace. The announcement of the birth of Jesus. The angels stated that we would know peace through Him. Jesus even tells His disciples right before the crucifixion, He tells them that He will give them peace and not to be afraid. Peace is also the first word. Think about this. Peace is also the first word that He speaks, Jesus speaks to His disciples after His resurrection. Think about it for a second. Just think about this for a second. Entertain this thought. We are not, humans are not naturally at peace with God. In fact, we are at war with God, and because we are at war with God, we're at war with other people. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that, that we live in that at all times for, for certain. I get that. But I'm talking living in this flesh right now, we struggle. We struggle with things. We are tempted with things. We have two natures, as Paul writes, and you know, uh, that, that, that clashes against one another. 
our humanness, the flesh wants to fight against God and be at war with God. We are not naturally at peace with God. And consequently, as I said, as I already shared, because of that, we become at war, at odds with other individuals as well. As well. But through Jesus, through Jesus, we can experience real peace. And as I shared with you before, this real peace is not the absence of hardships or conflict. It is the peace, the true peace of God. No wonder Paul would later write and say this in chapter 4 of this same letter of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then guess what happens next? And the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, there's an order to this, and that's what Paul was writing about. Grace and peace to you. Grace comes before peace. There's an order to it. Throughout the Bible, we see that God's grace always precedes peace. Think about it. Our salvation we receive grace and then peace. God initiates it. God moves towards us, gives that in that grace as we already talked. And because of that, we uh, receive that grace and then we experience the peace of God. He always initiates. Think about it. Noah found favor in God's eyes. God came to, came to Abraham first. God came to Moses first. God, oh, and we could go on and on and on. God always seeks us first and we respond to Him, not vice versa. So it's grace and peace. Paul writes one last time in, in verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He took that common greeting and literally transformed it with the implications of our justification and reconciliation in Christ. My question would be to you, do you have grace and peace? Have you responded to God's free gift of grace and peace? Because I believe right now that if you have not, He is pursuing you. He's moving towards you and wanting to give you that grace and peace freely, receiving the grace and then the peace that comes after that. Maybe. We have received that grace and peace, but right now we're not really living in peace because our minds, like we talked last week, are filled with other things and not Christ. And so we're not at peace. We're struggling. We're stressed out. We are discouraged. We have other things on our minds because we're thinking about other things than Christ. We said last week that we, it's impossible for us to think about two things at once. So what are we truly thinking about? Where is our minds truly dwelling? If it's dwelling in Christ, we are going to be, we are going to be um, experiencing that grace and peace, which again, if, let me just close one last time with that last verse. In uh, verse seven, in the peace of God, which surpasses every thought, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I pray that you have that I pray that you have God's grace and peace. And if you don't, I pray that this, that this might be the time where you would turn to Him and receive that free gift of grace and salvation. I pray also that if you are struggling, that if you do have that grace and peace, but you may be struggling, and right now you don't feel like you're at peace, today might be the day you turn and you allow God to fill your mind with Christ Jesus once again dwelling on Him so that the peace of God will surpass all of your thoughts right now. Those negative thoughts and the things that Satan is putting in your mind that wants to bring you down. And instead, let Jesus guard your hearts and your minds. I pray that you would just spend some time thinking about that. Go back over, read down through chapter 1 there, and just spend some time dwelling in Christ. I hope to see you back here next week as well.